Okay, let's move on to uh, physics. Um, so first of all, let me introduce tensor network. Probably most of you already know uh, the not basic notation and things like that, but uh, just in case, let me repeat. So um, this is a standard notation we are going to use. So vector is just uh, one square or one circle or one triangle which with one, uh, one line sticking out of it. Uh, one line corresponds to one uh, index, in this case i. So vi is this diagram. And matrix naturally has two, two indices and two legs. So a matrix is represented in most cases some, uh, by, the, by the diagram like this. And tensor, uh, so in this case, uh, three, lambda three tensor is represented by this kind of diagram. So notation should be uh, pretty obvious, I guess. And then tensor network. What is tensor network? Tensor network is something like this. I mean, this is a part of tensor network. And if you want to write, express this thing in a conventional uh, formula, it would look like this. Uh, this, uh, this tensor, uh, two, rank two tensor j, uh, z, i, j, is a kind of partial contraction of these four tensors. And this uh, index of this tensor is contracted with uh, index of this tensor C. So uh, A has a little index L here, and C has a little index L here. So uh, by, uh, okay, in this case, <coughs> I have ex explicitly written. But in any way, you, you, you contract uh, these, these, these indices. <coughs> So, but uh, I mean, if you look at this uh, kind of formula, I mean, probably mo for most of you, it's not immediately clear which index is contracted <coughs> with which. So uh, it's uh, it's much simpler or much clearer, uh, much more understandable in this way. Okay. So how how you distinguish a superscript and subscript in this diagram? Oh, I'm sorry. In this case, uh, there are not much. Uh, yeah, importance. Uh, I mean, which is uh, up here and which is down here. Uh, in some application, like mirror, uh, there there are meaning. I mean, upscript and downscript. But in most cases, I mean, for example, in pet, uh, I mean, I mean, we we usually don't distinguish between uh, up indices and down indices. Okay, um, why do we uh, have to bother about the tensor networks? Okay, uh, since this is a very introductory uh, talk, uh, let me start from something, uh, I, you know, I mean, uh, something a little bit far from the technical thing. Okay, uh, this guy, uh, William Ockham, uh, is known uh, for many things, but among many, uh, it, it, he's famous for Ockham's razor, so-called. And uh, uh, basically, uh, the statement is something like, uh, uh, we should not increase assumptions if not necessary. So, in other words, uh, we should choose the simplest explanation when there are many possible explanations. And to to more more shorter version of that is a compressor model. And this is a simplest example, probably uh, uh, more a concrete example. Um, everybody knows uh, these square equations, and uh, suppose you have uh, this kind of data, and if you assume the linear fitting, uh, linear fitting curve, just just straight line, then optimal fitting may be something like this, and obviously this doesn't explain the data, and as a result, your prediction, this, which is this white circle, is far from uh, actual uh, data. So. Uh, if your model is too small, it, that, it doesn't explain the data. And if you increase or if you enlarge the model uh, by introducing more parameters, in this case a quadratic function, then uh, you can nicely fit the data. And this uh, uh, model or this assumption explains the data with minimum, as minimal amount of assumption, uh, sort of. Sort of. However, if you further increase uh, the model, or well, further uh, introduce uh, more parameters, then uh, it sort of overfit the uh, data, uh, and your result 
looks like something like this. And uh, in this case, it, the, it explains the data, but uh, can the prediction or ge gen generalization does not work. Uh, in this particular case, uh, your prediction is somewhere around here, and uh, the correct answer is up here. So, uh, I mean, this is an example that shows that you have to choose the right model. I mean, sort of minimum model, minimum model. That corresponds to what uh, uh, Occam or William uh, used to say. Of course, this is not the guy who first uh, noticed this, this kind of fact. Of course, I mean, ancient people probably knows that. But uh, this guy was famous for uh, uh, intentionally use this kind of, uh, I mean, principle. In, in his argument. So, okay, uh, since tensor network is often used as a variational function, uh, let me uh, briefly um, uh, review the variational principle. Variational principle is something like this. Uh, suppose you want to have the ground state. Uh, then uh, what you do is you assume some model some wave function which depends on the parameter p. And here, the psi p, your variational wave function is sort of model, and the p is parameters. And uh, uh, as a result, you get uh, this uh, expectation value of the energy as a function of parameter p. And uh, you might uh, want to uh, minimize this uh, energy with respect to this parameter p. And, uh, Oftentimes, you use a uh, steep HTT center type uh, algorithm to, to obtain, to search for uh, the optimal value <coughs> P. And traditionally, traditional variational principle uh, uses only one or a few parameters. Uh, in, in any way, the number of parameters, in traditional application, the number of parameters does not depend on the system size or the size of the model, size of the system you are dealing with. And uh, it often gives you a nice insight. I mean, for example, it is very well known that if you use uh, only one parameter which corresponds to the uh, other parameter, for example, and you, you end up with the mean field result, mean field uh, approximation. So mean field approximation is nice. I mean, it gives you a nice insight to, for the system of interest. So it's, it's good. But uh, of course, everybody knows that uh, it is good, but it is the model is too small to be quantitatively correct. So, uh, oh, on the other hand, uh, there are some uh, variational principle calculations which contains uh, parameters as many as uh, one hundred thousand. Um, it it gives you a pretty accurate result, but in many cases. Uh, the approximation is not controllable, uh, meaning that uh, there is no uh, system, systematic way to improve the approximation. Or there is no proof that uh, uh, by inc simply increasing the number of parameters, you end up with, eventually you converge to the correct answer, exact result. So in, in many cases, variational, traditional variational principle calculation uh, is, is either too small to be quantitatively correct or uh, not controllable. So here comes the tensor network state. Tensor network state is something like this. Okay, this is wave, your wave function. <coughs> and uh, uh, any wave function can be expanded by some uh, basis set, or complete orthogonal basis set. Uh, in many cases, uh, it's, yeah, in, in uh, in the case of quantum spin system, it's like Ising spins, plus, plus or minus one uh, here. Uh, each variable takes a, a plus one or minus one here. And you can express uh, your wave function uh, in terms of uh, these uh, basis set. And if this coefficient is quite general coefficient, uh, your, I mean, ex this expression is always exact. However, in order to express uh, the wave function, a arbitrary, arbitrary wave function exactly, the number of parameters you need is uh, number of uh, elements of this guy. And if there is no structure of this, for this guy, 
the number of elements is simply the number of combinations of all of these uh, variables, which is 2 to, two to the n. So uh, exact model is very large. Exact model is usually exponentially large. In this case, 2 to the n. Uh, in principle, it's uh, exponentially large. On the other hand, as I said, uh, in traditional application of variational principle, the number of parameters is of, of order 1. So it's, it's like this. So it's too small. And the exact model, of course, it's nice, but it's I mean, too large, I mean, uh, it, meaning that uh, it's intractable. If you have as many as uh, 2 to the n parameters, uh, you cannot deal with uh, this uh, within a reasonable computation time or within your uh, computer memory. So uh, you definitely want to have something in between. Uh, and Tensor Network uh, provides you with that. Uh, namely, Tensor Network model uh, is, uh, OK, let's consider this coefficient uh, represented as a uh, tensor network like this. This tensor network has its open ends here, 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 here. And open ends correspond to these uh, Ising variables. And also it, it's uh, 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 inner indices like, like these. And these inner indices are called the virtual index, which are to be traced out. And uh, these physical indices are not traced out. It's contracted with uh, this uh, basis wave function. So if you can express the wave, your wave function using this tensor network coefficient, OK, this whole network uh, represents this coefficient. And if you can represent this wave function in this way, uh, how many parameters do you need? The number of parameters you need is basically uh, proportional to the number of tensors. And in most applications, of course, you can, you can, you can con consider uh, arbitrary tensor network, uh, which has uh, too many tensors. But in most applications we are going to discuss, uh, the number of tensors is of order of n. And here is the number of uh, degrees of freedom. So uh, tensor network model is the model which has all order n parameters in this sense. OK, uh, let me uh, briefly go through uh, several examples of tensor networks. OK, first example is classical spin model. Classical spin model itself is a tensor network. Although it is not uh, this type of tensor network, it is not uh, it is not this type of tensor network. So maybe this, I should not call this the first example uh, because there, is, there are no open ends. Okay. As I said, I mean, uh, tensor network as a um, quantum wave function should have open ends like this. But uh, the, this example, which I should not call example, doesn't have an open ends. It's, it's closed network. In any way, uh, this is tensor network in any way. Uh, suppose uh, you have two-dimensional Ising model, and uh, uh, there are weight function defined, and uh, you can consider this uh, two-dimensional Ising model uh, as the product of weights which is defined on every uh, shaded, every dark, I mean, uh, gray bucket. Suppose, okay, there, there are four bonds here, and there, these four bonds constitute a uh, plucket weight, which is represented by this uh, expression. And these four bonds are included in the, this uh, weight function defined on this uh, gray square. So this is one way of uh, viewing two-dimensional Ising model. And then, uh, okay, this is conventional way of uh, expressing two-dimensional Ising model. But you, you can consider a slightly different way of drawing picture for two-dimensional Ising model. OK, uh, in this conventional way of uh, drawing picture, you usually represent uh, one single spin by, dot, by a dot or a circle or whatever. But instead of representing using a dot or a circle, uh, 
let us uh, represent it by a line like this. So on this line, one bit degree of freedom is defined. And likewise, this spin is represented as a line like this. Uh, and uh, on this line, uh, one, degree of, one bit degree of freedom is defined. And in this way, you can, uh, you can switch from this kind of picture to this kind of picture. I mean, model is not changed. I mean, just a way of, uh, a way of drawing a picture is dif uh, different. And then, uh, this, looks like, this, mo this looks more like a tensor network. Uh, okay, on this square, little square, uh, the tensor is defined. Uh, this is exact the definition of tensor here. And this tensor has four indices, one, two, three, four, and each index corresponds to original spin. And then, uh, now it probably is obvious to everybody uh, that uh, uh, partition function of this Ising two-dimensional Ising model is nothing but the contraction of this tensor network. Uh, this is just a part of tensor network, but you can imagine the whole whole uh, network, two-dimensional network. So uh, you can you will, you are going to hear more about these classical applications of tensor network in uh, Nishino's lecture and the Tao Shan's lecture uh, probably. Okay, in any way, Ising model is the simplest tensor network. Okay, the second, actually the first example of the a tensor network as a quantum wave function is this. Uh, this is famous uh, matrix product state or uh, DMRG. Okay, uh, if you want to apply the tensor network method to one dimensional quantum spin system, the most, most natural tensor network you can imagine is something like this. Okay, here are uh, spins, original spins, quantum spins. And then uh, you can express your wave function, you can ex ex expand your wave function in terms of this kind of, uh, you know, I mean, basis set. And each basis set, uh, is okay in the case of spin one uh, this uh, sigma one and sigma two take three values minus one zero and one and in the case of spin one half it takes two values plus minus one or plus minus one half and okay uh, this is a simplest uh, tensor network and this was extremely successful as you know uh, and uh, this kind of tensor network can represent so-called AKLT state exactly. Uh, bond dimension in the case of AKLs, it, LT state is two. I mean, this bond can be two-dimensional. And the two-dimensional uh, chain of tensors can represent AKLT state exactly. And uh, if you change your system uh, from, a, uh, from a KLT model to uh, S of one antiferromagnetic Heisenberg model, then uh, exact representation is uh, more difficult. Uh, exact representation is difficult, but uh, approximate uh, representation can be achieved by this kind of uh, tensor network. And probably you will hear more about DMRG application in uh, to uh, Takami Toyama's lecture. Okay, third example uh, is PEPS, which is natural extension of this uh, DMRG or matrix product state to higher dimensions. Uh, here I uh, show two-dimensional uh, PEPS network, and this is this is just uh, I mean natural extension of this one-dimensional network to two-dimensional <coughs> network. Here, little white circles represent uh, physical spins. And on top of two-dimensional physical uh, array of physical spins, you uh, put this, uh, this, this network, which has exactly the same form as your uh, program, as your system. And then uh, you can at least uh, think about tensor network that may or may not represent your uh, quantum state. And you will hear more about uh, this uh, perhaps, uh, in uh, Roman uh, Olu's lecture and the Philip Holbo's lecture and uh, several other lectures probably. 
And this kind of uh, network can uh, exactly express the two-dimensional uh, AKLT state, but more general two-dimensional uh, variational, uh, not variational, valence bond solid state can be also approximately uh, expressed by this kind of network. Okay, uh, how, okay, uh, I have, so far I have not explained how you can obtain uh, the physical quantity out of the tensor network. Okay, you can, you may be able to express your state, uh, I mean, in terms of tensor network. That's one thing. But uh, uh, even if you, you know that this particular network uh, represents your uh, target wave function, Still, it is not so trivial to get uh, your physical quantity, energy, or specific heat, or magnetization out of this network. It's, not, it's completely another task. So let me explain how uh, actual computation uh, goes you, when you want to uh, really compute some, some specific quantity. First of all, you need to obtain tensors. I mean, arbitrary tensor cannot explain uh, your uh, wave function. So you have to choose the right tensor to uh, approximate your uh, wave function. How to, get, how to do that? Uh, suppose you want to obtain some uh, ground state of some Hamiltonian H. Then you want to uh, apply uh, your wave function. OK. Uh, So the simplest way to obtain uh, the wave function that is uh, close to ground state is starting from arbitrary uh, state, uh, multiply, uh, operate this uh, kind of imaginary time uh, evolution operator, and take the limit of uh, infinite imaginary time. Then you get um, ground state. But usually this operator is global operator, which is very difficult to compute. So uh, you can decompose this uh, um, yeah. You can decompose this by so-called Trotta, Suzuki Trotta formula, which means that um, And uh, suppose n is some large integer, and uh, this is almost uh, identical operator when m is very large, then you can approximate this uh, uh, this operator by by this one <coughs> by, by this. You can decompose the global operator into some uh, product of local operators like this. This Hij is uh, just a pair Hamiltonian. So you end up with uh, uh, this, this formula, and you plug, it, plug in this formula into uh, here. Then uh, what you get is uh, just start from any, any wave function. Uh, any wave function. Then apply this kind of local operator many, many times. Then you will get uh, approximate uh, solution for the ground state. That's basic uh, strategy. Uh, let's see. So, uh, of course, this is not the only way, but uh, this is uh, uh, one of the most uh, frequently used uh, method for obtaining the ground state. So uh, when you want, want to apply this kind of idea to the tensor network, suppose you, this, this is the tensor network state already. Uh, tensor network state uh, with tensor A. Suppose uh, phi is something like this.
then uh, you apply this uh, operator to this uh, uh, wave function, which means that you apply this operator, something like this. And then again, you apply uh, something similar here. OK, let's, let's call this 1, 2, 3, 4. So here, we should apply pair Hamiltonian of uh, H12, uh, uh, and here we you have to apply A34, something like that. Then uh, you get, suppose uh, you have uh, some method to uh, approximate this part by some different uh, tensor using some different tensor <coughs> and yeah this is a uh, new uh, wave function suppose you have some way to map this uh, part of the tensor network to this thing uh, the, exactly the same form uh, of, as the original uh, tensor network with slightly different tensor. The original tensor is A, and the, the uh, new tensor is A prime. And A prime is the result of application of imag a local uh, imaginary time uh, evolution operator. Then, uh, okay, here this uh, diagram uh, represents this part. Then, uh, then the, your task is basically uh, obtain uh, this uh, new tensor A prime, uh, in such, uh, so that uh, this resulting part here is the most gross, closest approximation of original uh, this part of tensor network. And uh, of course, the details uh, I cannot uh, explain all the details uh, in my lecture. But probably uh, Philip Kolbo and other lecturers uh, will talk about uh, how to uh, do this task. OK, this is the first uh, part of your calculation. First, you want to adjust uh, these uh, tensor elements, starting from arbitrary tensor, gradually optimize uh, your tensor. And uh, you, if you repeat many, many, many times, then eventually your A prime uh, converges. And then uh, uh, that, that's what you want. And this is the first step of the calculation. And the second step of the calculation is, OK, now you have a tensor network which is supposed, supposed to represent your wave function. But still, you have to take some, uh, uh, some contraction of the tensor network in order to obtain the physical quantity. For example, uh, suppose you have tensor op already optimized. Suppose you have already optimized tensor network. Then how can you obtain the energy uh, of the system, ground state energy in this case? The ground state energy can be obtained by, yeah, if you assume the translational invariance, then the expectation value of local uh, pair Hamiltonian is uh, basically uh, the, the answer you want. So in order to compute the expectation value of the local pair Hamiltonian, you, you have to uh, compute something like this. So you have to compute the trace of this kind of network. And if your problem is one-dimensional problem, it's not so difficult because basically if you regard this part as a matrix, okay, this thing can be regarded as a matrix. A, A, okay, this is of course the the tensor with rank four, four rank, rank four tensor. But if you regard this these two indices, uh, uh, column index, and if you regard these two index together as a single uh, row, in, row index, 
let's say this is i and let's say this is j and this makes um, this uh, gives you uh, the this kind of matrix so basically it's a just a matrix multiplication and then uh, uh, if if this is just a thing yeah if the uh, your problem is one dimensional case one dimensional problem you can basically uh, take the construction of the whole network by simply uh, multiplying uh, this uh, matrix many, many, many times. So in, in the case of 1D, it's okay, but uh, in 2D and the higher dimensions, uh, you cannot do the same thing, as you know. Uh, in, if the, of course, uh, you can always use so-called transfer matrix technique. Even if your system is two-dimensional system, still, uh, if the width is finite, then you can regard the whole thing as a uh, one sort of quasi-one-dimensional system, and you can basically apply the same idea as one-dimensional uh, case. So you can uh, reformulate your uh, problem as a uh, one-dimensional uh, problem, or maybe if you know the trans uh, matrix method, numerical trans matrix method, you can do better. But uh, I mean, the taking a trace in this way uh, is its comp computational complex complexity is not polynomial. Uh, its computational complexity is proportional to the dimension of the uh, boundary Hilbert space, which means that. Suppose this is the, uh, the width of the strip is W, then uh, the computational complexity is proportional to uh, this, some exponential, yeah, exponential function of W. So uh, again, it's, in most cases, it's too difficult. I mean, if you want to have a uh, large, large W. So uh, here is, uh, nice way of taking the approximate trace of the two-dimensional network or I mean at least in principle you can apply this kind of method uh, to higher even higher dimensions three dimensions and four dimensions and the two-dimensional case it can be depicted like this okay this is so-called corner transsemantics method the corner okay here is your tensor uh, this guy this guy a or a prime here is your tensor. And you assume that uh, uh, one quarter of the whole system, okay, you have this tensor, and uh, this part, this is almost one quarter of the whole system, maybe infinite system. And the effect of this part on this thing can be approximate, approximated by uh, this guy, corner, this uh, corner tensor. That's the basic idea. Of course, it, I mean, it cannot be exact in, in most cases. Uh, it's approximation. But uh, this approximation turns out to be very good. So uh, if you can think of the procedure which maps uh, from this kind of configuration to this kind of configuration, you can repeat uh, this kind of procedure many, many times until uh, the C converges. And then if C, C converges, then it, uh, you can hope that uh, this C represents infinite part here uh, very well. I mean, at least as far as the inference of this part on this tensor is concerned. So that's the basic idea of the corner transfer matrix method. And of course, there are several other ways to take the contraction of the whole network. Uh, I mean, this is a field of very active development. So uh, uh, you can, you can uh, read many papers. Uh, there are so many things. I mean, I, I, can, I don't follow uh, every, uh, every development myself. But this is one of the... Uh, one of the most powerful methods so far. 
Okay, uh, the next example of, of variation of wave function uh, in terms of tensor network is a uh, mirror. And uh, probably this afternoon and uh, tomorrow morning, Glenn and Bambri will talk about this. Uh, so let me just uh, briefly say what, what it is like. And it is like this. Uh, okay, here, uh, down here are the physical indices, which are directly connected to the uh, uh, I mean basis set, basis set vector. So here are Ising spins. And uh, this is hierarchical, obviously this has a hierarchical structure, and uh, uh, in contrast to the PEPs, uh, which I explained in the previous uh, slides, in the PEPs, I mean, the basic structure of the tensor network is identical with your original problem, but here, uh, your original problem is here, and uh, this is one dimensional case. For one dimensional problem, you get something like, I mean, this, I mean, the hierarchical structure. And, uh, okay, one of the characteristic points, nice, nice aspect of the mirror is you can, uh, you can take the exact contraction uh, in polynomial time. The reason is, uh, in mirror, uh, the, each, every tensor is not just an uh, arbitrary tensor. Every tensor has a special property. Uh, for example, these green guys, these green guys are basically unitary operators. Therefore, if you multiply uh, some green guy with its, with it by, by its uh, Hermitian conjugate, then you get the identity operator. Likewise, uh, Red triangles are not unitary operator, but it's called isometry. Mm -hmm. Isometry is a sort, I mean, generalization of the unitary operator. Uh, it has this, uh, this property. So you require these properties. And, with, uh, and you, within this requirement, you uh, uh, optimize every tensor, green guys and red guys. And then, uh, by using this property, uh, suppose you want to compute the expectation value of this pair operator. And this is just a part of the network, uh, not, not the whole thing. Uh, so, uh, this is just a part of the network. But the basic uh, thing is, uh, this part, you, although this part is connected to, to infinity, infinitely distant uh, places, but uh, even though it is connected to infinite distant places, uh, the calculation can be localized. That's the basic, basic thing, because, because of this property. Okay, here, here, okay, here we have this guy. So this guy, this guy can be repla replaced by these two straight lines. So these straight lines. So this and this are decoupled. This part and this part are decoupled because of this property. Uh, because of this property, you can localize your calculation. As a result, you can take the trace of this part uh, within a finite uh, computational time. That's the good, nice thing about mirror. And also, another nice thing about mirror is because it's, it has hierarchical structure, it's directly compatible to renormalization group. And you, there are ways to extract uh, uh, fixed point properties like uh, scaling dimensions and uh, uh, fusion rules and these kind of things uh, directly from the tensor itself. So uh, probably Glenn uh, is going to talk about uh, this kind of uh, aspect of the mirror uh, in, his, in his lecture. And also quite recently, uh, this not quite recently, but maybe uh, it's been around for some years now. But in any way, recently, uh, it was pointed out that this kind of mirror structure uh, <coughs> provides us with a nice representation of ADS-CFT correspondence. And probably this aspect can be uh, dealt with in uh, Tadashi Takayanagi's lecture. Okay. Um, I said that the uh, tensor network model is uh, just about right size. Uh, it's not too large uh, or it's not 
too too small. I mean, it's just I mean uh, it's just enough to express uh, many of uh, quantum systems of interest. Uh, but why is that? Uh, let me uh, briefly discuss about that. In order to understand why it is right sized, uh, maybe we have to uh, we have to know a little bit about entanglement. Okay, entang first of all, let me explain. The, uh, let me give you the definition of the entanglement. Uh, this is a conventional definition of entanglement entropy. Suppose we have a system and its subsystem A. System is whole system is omega and subsystem is A. And then uh, you can define the uh, density operator rho of the whole system. And then you take the partial trace over all the degrees of freedom which do not belong to A. I mean, the environment part here, this part. Then uh, you get uh, 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 density operator for A. So, uh, okay, this, this row A is, is a density operator of A. And if you define the von Neumann entropy of this uh, uh, row A, density, re reduced density operator of A, then uh, that's the definition of your entanglement entropy. So that, this is the definition, but uh, what does it mean? Uh, in order to understand the meaning of the entanglement and entropy, uh, maybe it's helpful to slightly generalize the idea of the entanglement entropy. Um, okay, here is the, the definition of mutual information, which is a generalized notion of the uh, entanglement entropy. Okay, uh, mutual information is defined in this way. Uh, Mutual information between A and B, I, A colon B, is defined as SA plus SB minus SA cup B. Um, okay, uh, here SA is uh, the, yeah, I mean, we, we have already uh, defined this SA in the previous slide, so meaning it should be clear. And SA cup B, uh, this this guy is the uh, reduced density redu I mean, okay the von Neumann entropy of the reduced density operator for uh, unified region A and B. And then uh, okay this is I mean this counts the independent this counts the entropy of A and B independently and this counts the entropy of A and B put together. And then uh, the uh, difference between these things gives you mutual information. And what does mutual information mean? Uh, okay, it means that the amount of information on B that we can obtain from the information on A. In other words, uh, you can not, you don't have, suppose you don't have a direct access to the region B. Uh, only thing you can do is just a observation or measurement on, on A. But you can, if there is some mutual information between A and B, you can learn something out of the measurement. Uh, you can learn something about B uh, only from the observation on A. That, and uh, this uh, mutual information gives you the maximum amount of information you can obtain in, in this way. And then uh, for pure state, actually this mutual information can be defined even for classical system. And, uh, and if you apply this notion to a pure state, pure quantum state, then uh, you, you recover uh, this entanglement entropy defined in previous slide. Uh, namely, uh, mutual information of region A and uh, the rest, environment of A. A bar is just, uh, just, just outside of A, the, everything except for A. Uh, then mutual information between A and A bar gives you uh, two times uh, entanglement entropy of uh, A, uh, which is has been which was defined in the previous slide. So um, and then uh, 
for classical system, uh, because we are going to, uh, this is a very important piece of information. For classical system, it is fairly easy to prove that uh, mutual information between a, region A and region B is bounded from above by the area. So, I mean, for classical case, uh, suppose this is classical system, then uh, mutual information between this guy and this guy is bounded from above by the, the, the uh, area of the surface of A. Uh, I'm talking about the, I mean, uh, short range interaction classical model. Short range interaction classical model, uh, I mean, uh, the mutual information is satisfies so called area law. Okay, uh, let's keep this fact in, mind, in our mind. Uh, this is for classical system. Uh, I have a question. Okay. What is the definition of uh, entanglement entropy for classical system? Uh, a density matrix? No, no, we, we, we don't. Okay, maybe we can, we can call the mutual information as entanglement entropy, but in classical case, we usually don't call it. We usually call it, call it just mutual information between A and A bar. Of course, you can call this entanglement entropy for classical system if you like, but we usually don't call it. This corresponds to the conventional entropy um, in the classical system. A, a, uh, well, it's I mean, not the entropy of the whole system. Yeah, you can call it uh, uh, entropy of the subsystem. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, the next important thing uh, is how large is uh, entanglement entropy uh, for typical quantum state. So here we have to be a little bit careful about what is a typical quantum state. So uh, if you take the typical quantum state as a uh, randomly chosen from uh, d-dimensional uh, Hilbert space. I mean randomly chosen state from the d-dimensional Hilbert space. If you define a typical state in that way, then uh, we know that uh, the uh, entanglement entropy of such a state satisfies the volume law rather than area law. Uh, this is, there is a theorem. Suppose uh, we have this kind of system, omega and A, subsystem A. And if you, uh, if you define this uh, entanglement entropy of this system A, and if you take the average over so-called invariant Haar measure uh, over the whole his Hilbert space, and uh, okay, this invariant Haar measure is basically the uniform measure over all the uh, Hilbert space. If you uh, take the average in this way, then it, it has been proved that uh, this entanglement entropy is proportional to the volume of A, not the surface, the volume the whole volume. So uh, if you define the typical state in this way, entanglement entropy is proportional to the volume, not the surface. On the other hand, uh, we also know that in most uh, quantum states of interest, physical interest, uh, it satisfies area law. So for example, uh, it has been known that, uh, I mean, two dimension, in two dimensions or higher, a uh, free boson or fermion system with a finite gap, the entanglement entropy satisfies the area law. Uh, entanglement entropy is bounded from above by the area of the subsystem, uh, which is proportional to L to D minus one where L is the size uh, linear dimension of the uh, region you are uh, thinking about. And uh, a slight exception is here. Uh, in the case of gapless fermion uh, in 1D, uh, 
entanglement entropy is proportional to log L. Uh, if you apply the area law into one dimensional system, since uh, the area of the boundary of one dimensional region is always of order one, uh, it should be proportional to some, some constant, which doesn't depend on the system size. But this is a little bit of exception. Uh, for gapless Fermi chain, it's proportional to log L, but not, not the volume. Uh, in this case, not, not proportional to L, but, but it's, it's proportional to log L. So in any way, important message here is that uh, finite dimensional uh, quantum states are very, very special. Uh, since uh, typical state averaged over all the Hilbert space satisfies the uh, volume law instead of area law. But uh, uh, we are interested in the state, quantum states, which satisfies the area law. So it's, it's very special. However, the possible exception may be a random system. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not the expert on this uh, topic, so I don't know much about that. But uh, uh, random systems it may give some interesting example about uh, this uh, area law or volume law and these kind of things, uh, in entanglement entropy. Uh, maybe uh, you learn a lot more about uh, this kind of issue in a uh, lecture which will be given by Frank Pullman. Okay, uh, so far I have been trying to convince you that the tensor network state is a sort of classical model. Uh, and therefore, it belongs to the same class. I mean, as I, I said, I said classical model automatically satisfies area law. And the uh, tensor network is sort of classical model. These two things I, I explained already. So put together, uh, tensor network state automatically belongs to area law class which is a very, rather special class of quantum state. So this is the answer to, maybe not the complete answer, maybe partial answer, but uh, this is an uh, answer to the question why we have to bother about uh, tensor network state. Okay, uh, from now on I have uh, 30 minutes left. So I uh, switch gear and uh, quick, quickly uh, go through uh, several, several issues which will be discussed in, uh, in the following lectures. Okay, first interesting topic is real space remodelization group with tensor network. Uh, I, mean, I gave uh, several, I mean, I mean, several lectures on uh, remodelization group in uh, graduate school course or undergraduate school course. And uh, one of the most unsatisfactory part of uh, lectures in the renormalization group is whenever I talk about real space renormalization group, or maybe renormalization group in general, I cannot give a uh, good, simple, and exact uh, uh, example for the renormalization group. I mean, if we can explain the renormalization group as in some sort of nice idea. But you cannot uh, really present a nice, uh, simple example which, in which the renormalization group works exactly. Uh, yeah, of course there are several things, but uh, <coughs> usually too complicated. So, but here, uh, real space renormalization group can be implemented in the language of, of tensor network very nicely. And uh, real space, even real space renormalization group works almost exactly. Um, you know, I mean, real space uh, uh, realization group, um, Migdal Kadanov, uh, Migdal Kadanov approximation is uh, one of the most uh, uh, famous example. Uh, but uh, as everybody knows, Migdal Kadanov uh, realization group does not give you an uh, exact answer. However, if you use a uh, realization uh, tensor network uh, scheme, uh, you can get almost uh, exact uh, result. Okay, uh, how it, let me explain how it uh, looks like. You're starting from two-dimensional Ising model again. Uh, what you do is replace every uh, tensor by two pair of two tensors like this. Uh, orange dot is replaced by this. Green dot here is replaced by these two tensors. 
yeah, suppose, suppose we can do that. Then, uh, as a result, we get uh, uh, another network like this. And then, okay, we can partially contract these four tensors, uh, local tensor network, to just a single tensor like this. And as a result, uh, we get another tensor network like this. And so, uh, uh, I mean, nice, this is very nice. And as long as this replacement is exact, uh, the mapping from this tensor network to this tensor network is exact. But the problem is, in order to make this mapping from here to here exact, you have to make this uh, uh, index, make this bond, uh, this, uh, you, you have to make the dimension of this bond as large as these two bonds put together. Uh, in other words, suppose this uh, edge, this bond uh, is I mean, three-dimensional, and suppose this bond is four-dimensional. Then, in order to make this mapping exact, you have to make this bond 12 dimensional. Three times, three times four is 12. So it's, you have to make this 12 dimensional. Yes? So what's the meaning of the local tensor in this uh, local, te local tensor, I mean, I maybe may please forget about local. I mean, it's just tensor. This, I, I call this tensor. I mean, and Oh, fiscal, 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 you are worrying about so, fiscal indices? Yeah, so what is the meaning of this tensor method? <coughs> oh, okay, okay. Uh, is the part, yeah, let, let's suppose we are talking about partition function. But, uh, of course, uh, even if we talk about, uh, I mean, uh, wave function, uh, you, if you imagine PEPs, then uh, physical indices uh, are hidden. Uh, below below this circle, and uh, I mean you you uh, yeah yeah something like that yeah okay uh, so yeah for time being let's suppose uh, we are talking about two dimensional Ising model just to close the tensor network and then uh, as I said this bond must be thick uh, much much thicker than uh, original bond. So uh, this, this bond is here, and this bond is here. So uh, this bond must be thick in order to make the mapping exact. So uh, by, by repeating this procedure many, many times, then eventually uh, this uh, dimension of this uh, bond uh, is uh, intractable. It's too, too large. So uh, in order to make the whole procedure tractable, uh, you have to introduce some sort of approximation in this procedure. So I mean, yeah, this, uh, this part uh, will be uh, explained in more detail by Grenier Bambly, uh, maybe this afternoon or maybe uh, tomorrow morning. Um, Okay, but in any way, uh, the trick is uh, the singular value decomposition. Singular value decomposition is universal. It's, uni it's everywhere in tensor network calculation. So, uh, I mean, no matter what you use. Uh, so let me briefly explain how it how it, uh, it's look like. So from here to here, I said this bond must be thick, but uh, uh, you at the, at the same time, you want to keep it uh, small, as small as possible. So in order to do that, uh, what uh, this is a st uh, this is a standard strategy. First of all, regard this uh, four rank four tensor as a chi square times chi square matrix by uh, by combining these two alpha beta these two uh, indices together to make a single index i, and also binding these two indices gamma and delta to make one single index J. So regard, just, just regard, just regard this tensor as a matrix in this way. 
and then uh, apply a singular value decomposition to this matrix, uh, and then you get something like this. this. These two are unitary matrices, and lambda is diagonal matrices of the singular values. And then uh, you truncate, you simply truncate. Uh, you, you throw away all the, almost all the uh, singular values which are smaller. And you, you keep only largest uh, singular values. Then you get the lambda, uh, lambda hat. Lambda hat is now chi times chi diagonal matrix, uh, rather than chi squared times chi squared uh, diagonal matrix. And then uh, you get the new uh, T. And then, uh, just by splitting this lambda into two halves, lambda square, lambda square, and by redefining these two tensors, T1, T2, in this way, and then you get uh, approximate mapping from this one and this one. Of course, I'm simplifying the argument. This is not the best choice uh, for T1 and T2. And, but details, please listen to uh, Graham Evangelist's lecture. I, I'm just... Uh, for, for the simplicity of the lecture, uh, for the simplicity of the argument, uh, I, I just simplify here. So in this way, you can keep uh, the dimension of this uh, intermediate bond manageable. And the nice thing about uh, this tensor network is also here. Uh, suppose, um, let me see. Uh, no more. Uh, okay. Suppose this procedure converges. Uh, I mean, this this procedure. Suppose this procedure, after applying many many times, this procedure. Suppose you get the convergence. Then, uh, nice thing about this uh, tensor network thing is, uh, once you get after you got you have obtained the convergence, then uh, out of this tensor uh, directory, you can get uh, all the nice information about critical or fixed point uh, information, like a central charge or, um, or a scaling dimension here, by computing the eigenvalues of this single tensor. Uh, uh, okay, this, this, this part is contracted already, so as a result, this uh, tensor becomes partial traces has been taken. And then this, this tensor is just matrix. And by computing the eigenvalues of this matrix, you can get the information about central charge and the scaling dimension. OK. Uh, here is a little bit of improvement uh, of this uh, renormalization group procedure. Uh, and yeah, basically, OK, I, I'm not going to explain what these uh, hideous diagrams mean. But uh, uh, the important point of this improvement is that you can get rid of local entanglement better in this way. And therefore, uh, it, the resulting uh, procedure of renormalization group converges faster when uh, the one dimension is increased. So uh, probably this, this part is also uh, explained in more detail by uh, Evan, Evan Lee. Okay, uh, here is an example for the example of the tensor network applied to classical system. In two-dimensional application, we don't usually use uh, so large uh, bond dimension uh, compared to the bond dimension typically used in DMRG. Bond dimension typically used in DMRG is like 100 or even 1,000, but uh, in this kind of application, of tensor network for two dimensions. Uh, typical bond dimension is, like you see here, 4, 8, or 10, or something, something around 10 at the most. So you might think that uh, if you use uh, such a small tens uh, bond dimension, then the resulting uh, approximation is not so accurate. But actually, it is pretty accurate. It is, if you use a bond dimension of 8, you can reduce the error in the free energy as small as 10 to the minus 7. Uh, this, is, this picture is taken from uh, Grant's paper. And this is the uh, magnetization curve as a function of temperature, which is pretty accurate. You cannot distinguish between the numerical data and the exact solution. So it's this kind of uh, uh, 
you know, truncation is not so bad. Okay, this this uh, this kind of thing will be discussed in uh, Tomotoshi Nishino's lecture and also Tao Shan's lecture as well as Graham Evanbury's lecture. Okay, uh, tensor networks uh, calculation also works for flash rate spin system. Uh, this is a uh, one piece of uh, example uh, taken from uh, Okubo-san's uh, work. Uh, Okubo-san is sitting somewhere yeah, in, in the front row. And this is a little bit old picture. I mean, so this is a little bit messy. Uh, so please uh, listen to his talk in Monday's symposium, maybe next week or maybe the third one. Uh, he is going to uh, show you better uh, or latest, latest result about Kagome lattice. But uh, we are in this, at this point, uh, we have already uh, got a nice result. And uh, okay, this, in this picture, uh, I compare Okubo-san's result with uh, uh, DMRG result. DMRG result is some, somewhere here, and somewhere here, this black, thin black curve is DMRG result, which was the best result at this point uh, previously. And uh, this green, uh, not, this uh, blue curve is the result of Okubo-san's calculation, and it, it already converges. Uh, I mean, this is D for bond dimension four calculation is slightly different from bond dimension five or bond dimension six calculations, but the bond dimension five calculation and bond dimension six result uh, agree with each other already. So uh, we are pretty sure that uh, this curve doesn't change so much even I mean when the bond dimension is increased even further. Okay, uh, another important application of the tensor network, uh, tensor network is a fermion system. And here is, here I've taken pictures from uh, Philip Kolpo's uh, paper on two-dimensional TJ model. Uh, fermion system is one of the toughest problem, uh, but the fermion sign problem can be solved uh, nicely within the framework of tensor network by introducing uh, this, uh, I mean, uh, this uh, closing, uh, I don't remember the name of this uh, particular tensor, which handles the fermion signs, basically. So these black dots uh, take, take care of this uh, commutation, anti-commutation relation of fermions, basically. So uh, basically, we can compute uh, fermion systems uh, by PEPs, Within the computational time, which is uh, not much more than the computation time required for I mean, other systems, and uh, oops, uh, and Philip Colvo has already obtained a better result. It doesn't converge yet. I mean, this is one of a D. D is a dimension bond dimension, uh, so it doesn't converge yet. But already uh, his result is better than the previously best result obtained by uh, fixed node quantum Monte Carlo simulation. Okay, another good aspect of tensor network is you can deal with the symmetry uh, more direct way in some sense. Uh, suppose you have local symmetry like this, uh, local symmetry, okay, this UI is the unitary operator which acts on site I. And uh, you, you apply the same unitary operator for, for all, all sites at the same time. Then you get, uh, you get uh, your, your, your state again. Um, so, I mean, this, your state, suppose your state has, a, has this symmetry. Then, oh, has this um, invariance. And then, uh, if, you have, if your state has this invariance, then you, you, it directly maps onto the property, special property of the tensor. If this uh, web function is represented as tensor network or matrix product state with a tensor A, matrix A. Uh, okay, if this, if this, your system, uh, your state satisfies this, your tensor A must satisfy this uh, invariance. You apply 
uh, this U here, I mean this same U here, and uh, there exists some unitary operator, U and U dagger, uh, then uh, by applying all of these uh, unitary operators together at the same time, then you get uh, 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 this uh, tensor A, except for this uh, uh, phase factor. And then uh, you, by, by this, uh, you can uh, relatively easily show that uh, uh, such a state has a string order, I mean, which is defined in this way. This kind of property, it was, I guess this will, I mean, uh, it, it will be discussed in lecture given by Norbert Schuch. And another application is to quantum chemistry. And this is a, a very interesting application of a tensor network, actually matrix product state, to the Mangan cluster, which is relevant to photosynthesis. And the, the picture is taken from Krasige and uh, Garnet Chan and the Yanai San. Uh, which appeared in Nature Communication, Nature uh, Chemistry. Um, so this this picture, I mean, I don't I don't know what this means actually, but uh, obviously they computed uh, the electronic electronic structure, electronic state of this uh, Mangan cluster. And uh, also another application is to quant quantum chromodynamics. Uh, since we can deal with fermion systems uh, as simple as other, other, other quantum systems, so the hope is eventually we can, uh, we can deal with uh, 3 plus 1 dimensional SU3 gauge theory. Uh, if it is possible, of course we have not reached that stage yet. There are a lot of difficulties yet. So. Uh, uh, so far, the uh, only thing we, they, they have achieved is uh, more or less 1 plus 1 dimensional relativistic fermions with U1 gauge field, uh, which is called Schwinger model. Uh, not, uh, not much, <laughs> but the uh, uh, hope is eventually by improving uh, on the tensor network calculation, tensor network method, Eventually, we will be able to deal with the uh, gen generic phase diagram, QCD phase diagram, which includes, which includes uh, early universe and uh, neutron stars here, and things like, like that. Many interesting stuff should be, should be clarified by the tensor network. That is a hope. Maybe it's a, high, high, too, a little bit too high hope, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah. here is this there is a hope. And uh, probably uh, Marie Carmen will talk about that. Uh, and also Luca Tagliacozzo will talk about that probably. And uh, another issue which will be discussed in the lecture, lectures is uh, how to make a program easy. How to make programming easy. Because uh, tensor net, <coughs> if, if you have any ex experience in tensor network uh, programming, uh, the toughest part, the, actually the le typical length of tensor network pro program is not so long. But uh, uh, the bookkeeping of indices is very, very uh, tedious and complicated. And you can easily make mistakes. Uh, so uh, it is very e important to develop a nice toolbox for programming. And uh, here is one activity uh, made by group, I mean, in Jack House group in Taiwan. And uh, he probably he will be talking about uh, the development of uh, programming tool, pro programming toolbox. Okay, let me summarize my uh, talk. Uh, Tensor network models and the states provide us with the right size <coughs> representations of many physical systems of interest. And many new methods are being developed uh, for exploiting them. So, uh, in previous state. Uh, before finishing, uh, let me put uh, a little bit of advertisement. Uh, we are hiring one or two postdocs. Uh, starting sometime in school year 2016. Uh, school year in Japan means that uh, uh, school, school year starts in April and ends 
in March. So school year 2016 means until uh, before, before March 2017. And successful candidate will work at ISSP uh, and uh, he or she develops uh, tensor network algorithms and goals aiming at massive productive runs on post K computer which will be ready in sometime in 2020 or something. Uh, expected term of appointment three years, uh, but it's annual, annual, base, uh, annual basis contract extendable uh, until March 2020. Uh, if you are interested, uh, please ask me. <coughs> That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any question? Maybe you can ask me question of uh, every each each lecture. I just this my talk is just a catalog of lectures, <coughs> so maybe you don't have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> So you emphasize that maybe the success of the Tesla network and the approach would be related to the, uh, the locality or area of the oh. environment. And the, what do you think about the possibility of application to the system without final energy? Uh, yes, uh, okay. Uh, it's it's a very subtle uh, gapless issue. System. Yeah. Gapless system. Yeah, gapless system is very subtle issue. So uh, in gapless system, at least correlation or entanglement is long range. So uh, it's not restricted in the finite area. That's true. But uh, at the same time, uh, we Let ask a related questions. You also showed the application to. Uh, Final temperature phase transition Isaac system. Mm -hmm. that, that's, a, that's a kind of the, I don't know, the uh, information, uh, what, what do you say? Uh, that's a kind, kind of the inequality doesn't have any similarity at the transition temperature. I mean, the, usually we say that the, at the transition temperature, at the critical point, mm -hmm. the creation becomes infinite. Right, 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 yes. So yeah. Such a kind of the area or uh, locality yeah, of course, of has course, nothing uh, to do with uh, the criticality of the phase transition? Of course, uh, Texas Network feels that. Uh, <coughs> Texas Network definitely feels the yeah. criticality. As you can see here. Necessarily, they meant the increases. Yeah, as you can see here, this is a transition <coughs> point and the errors becomes larger near the transition point, not exactly at the transition point, but uh, there obviously there is uh, some sort of singularity around the uh, uh, transition point. So tensor network feels it. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I, I should, uh, we should recall the fact that uh, uh, Ising model itself is a tensor network. And the Ising model is uh, only the bond dimension of this tensor network is uh, only two. So bond, tensor network with only two, I mean, two dimensional bonds can exactly express the uh, criticality. Yeah. So, uh, okay, if the, all the correlations and entanglement are short range, uh, probably it's not surprising that uh, the tensor network can express uh, such a state. But uh, contrary is not necessary to, I mean, which means that uh, even if the uh, correlation becomes long range, uh, I mean, tensor network has some capability of explain, I mean, expressing that. Uh, but y yes, you're, you're right. I mean, certainly in the vicinity of the critical point, uh, the, uh, I mean, this uh, representation of tensor network rep representation becomes harder. Um, but yeah, maybe yeah. I mean, that's 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 uh, I mean, that's the only thing I can say at the for time being. Maybe uh, somebody else uh, should know better than me. <laughs> Yeah. 
yeah, criticality and uh, area, law, area, area law is a very interesting issue. Yeah, of course, uh, the by of course, in order to break the area law, certainly long range correlations and long range uh, uh, entanglement is necessary in order to break area law. That's that's for sure. But what kind of long range interaction, long range correlation, or long range entanglement breaks the area law? I don't know. Okay, then uh, let's move forward to lunch. <laughs>